Dr. Lisa Boseman. I'm with the Metal Valley Community Preparedness Committee. And um, the purpose of the Metal Valley Community Preparedness Committee is to prepare citizens to meet basic needs in the face of unforeseen economic, energy, or environmental disruptions and to strengthen our valley's economy. Uh, we're a bit of a hybrid organization. We've embraced the concepts of transition town, but we have actually modeled our efforts around the work of uh, Port Townsend's L2020 group. Uh, and we came under the issue, we came under the banner, yes. And L2020, you can find at L2020.org, Mentown Valley Community Preparedness Committee. You can see at MD Community Preparedness.org. We're out. We decided to go under the banner of preparedness, uh, like the L2020 group did, simply because we live in a rural community that has some fairly um, conservative elements, and we really wanted to speak beyond the choir. If we would have come out under the banner of sustainability, we would have immediately alienated about 50% of our community. So the issue of preparedness really speaks to our community and resonates. We live in the middle of a fire zone. We're surrounded by 1.4 million acres of uh, of national forest. We have temperatures that can plummet down to 20 below. Our grid goes down. People get the need to prepare. So by going under the banner of preparedness, we immediately made ourselves relevant to the community. We had something to offer. Um, our organization is um, also embracing the issue of transition town by doing public education events. And we decided to tackle five different areas, short-term emergency preparedness, economic security, food security, energy security, and climate change. And in an effort to get a good launch into our community and build trust with our organization, we've decided to launch with short-term emergency preparedness. The reason being is that we felt if we could help organize our community to meet basic needs in the, in the event of an unforeseen natural disaster or emergency, uh, then our community would be in a better position to um, weather the longer um, um, emergencies that we feel are coming down the pike. But um, by, by addressing the issue of short-term emergency preparedness, we were able to create um, some real appreciation in our community that we were actually undertaking this issue because uh, we, didn't want, we, we didn't want to scare people. People are already scared. What we offered them is a way to build courage and confidence by working within their community to meet basic needs. All right, so when we approach this issue of emergency preparedness, we have this process. We formed our community of experts and defined goals. We created an event, mapped our community, conducted outreach, fundraised, and did promotion. So the first thing was to form our community of experts. Next. And uh, we are not experts in the area of emergency preparedness, but we have a large group of uh, first responders in our community. So we actually partnered with Okanagan County Emergency Management, the local fire districts, Department of Natural Resources, our local air, uh, mental rescue service, the police departments, the LDS Church, the Red Cross, the Ranger District. We pulled all these groups together as our experts around this issue, and I have to say they were thrilled. They were thrilled to have a community group that stepped up and said, we would like to help you do your job and get this issue out into the community. So together, the first responders in our committee, we defined goals. And what we decided that we wanted to do was identify uh, neighborhood leaders, uh, leaders in our community that could step forward and get some training to take this map your neighborhood flip chart out into their community. Emergency management has created this really wonderful guide on how to map your neighborhood, organize your neighborhood in the event of a disaster. Because what we know from um, disasters is that the first thing people do is they turn to our neighbors. So we figured if we could try and get as many um, households and neighborhoods prepared as possible, we would protect property and save lives. And in the process, really build community. So, um, so. <laughs> Where are we, Nancy? All right, so we created an event. All right, so here is our challenge. We want to take the issue of disaster, emergency disaster preparedness and make it fun. Now think about it, folks. That's a little bit of a challenge. So what we decided to do is create this neighborhood preparedness fair and barbecue. And we created about a 1,000 of these four by six cards that we could hand out in events and outreach. We have our little logo here. We have the, the type of event we have on the other side. 
And I gotta say, it got people's attention. For one thing, we were playing bluegrass and we were giving away free food. I mean, so <laughs> we had balloons, we had activities for the kids. The real goal was to pull people in so we could help educate them about the different ways that they could prepare and get them signed up to um, be neighborhood leaders. And we did it with free food. We had a free barbecue, fun activities for the kids, and we really wanted to make this kind of fun. You know, bluegrass music playing in the background. And, you know, these cute little balloons there. And it got people's attention and um, really seemed to work for us. So we, we built, we, we made about a thousand of these cards and we handed them out every place that we went. Um, the next thing we did is we actually mapped our entire valley. The valley is about 50 miles long from north of Mazama down to south of um, Carlton. And um, we, you know, living in a rural community, there isn't that sense of neighborhoods. What is a neighborhood? It's not a concept that we're familiar with. So we took, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pacific Biodiversity Institute, one of our members, Juliet Rhodes, is with them, and, and we worked with the fire department, and we actually created designated neighborhoods, 64 different designated neighborhoods throughout our own community. And then we used um, um, aerial photography to create um, maps of each one of these neighborhoods so people could visually see what their neighborhoods are. So we defined the neighborhoods for them. It made it easy for them to step into the process and they could go up to the map and go, oh, there I am, I'm neighborhood number 24. And, oh, there's a map of what my neighborhood is. And it just, it pulled people in sort of through that all self-interest to find out where they were in the bigger map and what their neighborhood looked like. And, um, and so then we conducted some outreach, and I gotta say the outreach I think was the key to success. We found that um, as opposed to waiting for people to come to us at WorkFest when we went to them, and we went to civic organizations, we went to the chambers of Congress, we went to the town councils, we went to faith organizations, neighborhood associations, business groups, and nonprofits. And we, we had our sort of you know dog and pony show. We talked about preparedness, how important it was to our community, what we were trying to achieve in terms of identifying neighborhood leaders and getting the extra training so that we could get our neighborhoods and households organized to meet basic needs in the event of a disaster. That message sold, people got it. And not only that, but once we went to some civic organizations, we could pitch our event and then we could ask them for money and they were happy to give it to us. So the outreach tool and the fundraising tool really worked hand in hand. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we didn't, I mean, we had no budget, but we needed about $650 and we raised 600, no, we needed $640 and we raised 650 despite basically talking about what we were doing in our community that was relevant to people they really saw the need. And I would, I can't stress that strongly enough. It is important to be relevant to your community and find out what the needs are and figure out how to fill it. And this really filled the need for us. So then we went into the promotion. I'm an outreach professional, so I have some background in this. It was a pretty easy thing for me to do. We were in the 4th of July parade. We created our banner out there. It's really cool. So we're really happy with that. We marched in the 4th of July parade. We handed out about 400 copies of our, our, um, our cards. Um, we created this really cool poster that's very colorful and inviting and pulled people in. It listed all the presenters, all of our um, our first responders, which are such an incredibly respected group in our community. So us partnering with them really helped us look um, um, important. It gave us some legitimacy right, by partnering with this group that so respected our community. And then we had, oh, I got 30 seconds left. Okay, so anyway, so photos of the events. Um, our event, I would say, we probably attracted about 100 people, and we signed up at to date about 40 people for the training to go through the training and become neighborhood leaders. It was a very moving event to see these um, all of our first responder organizations lined up in their uniform, talking about what they would do in the event of a disaster, what their organization would do, and then what us as individual community members would do. Uh, the first responders were just thrilled to have us do this and happy to be involved. The community was really happy with what it was we were able to do. And our outcome, I think, is that we raised awareness about the need for short-term emergency preparedness and we really built some sense of community. And neighborhoods are starting to organize and we created trust between our organization and our valley. So now as we move into the more you know, challenging issues of energy security and climate change. We've already established ourselves as a trusted organization out to do good things for our community. 
Um, and I think that's going to serve us well as we move down, you know, drill down to the, the, the just the more challenging issues transition entails. So that's our presentation. Thank you. Christy, tell them when you started organizing. We started organizing in, well, January in general, but this event we organized in June and we rolled it out in August, so we had about a two month turnaround for that. And while they're setting up, I'd really like to thank Judy Alexander from the L2020 group. The L2020 group has been such an inspiration to us as we, we move down this process. They're doing great work. And we have materials at the table. Feel free to take some there out there. While you're setting up, can you talk about the next step, the economic security? Yeah, we're going to be working on the issue of economic security, and we're just starting to wrap our minds around that. But I think we're going to use a similar model and partner with the experts in our area. It would be the Economic Alliance and North Central Washington Economic Development District. Our goal would be to try and relocalize and strengthen our local economy. Um, and, and that's an issue, a message that people get. The, the longer term purpose is that we want people to be able to successfully create businesses so that we can produce more of what we consume. We're going to try and create a climate that enables them to do that. So we have this message that we sort of roll out for our community, but we also have underlying goals that we're trying to achieve. Okay, um, I'm Barbara Green from Transition Reno, and we've been an organization since August of 2009. We have a little rat banner. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, we started in August of 2009. Uh, I took the training in Oakland, came back and talked to my permaculture group. So you'll notice that we, that's where I found a, a, a group of like-minded people that kind of got the system. So after speaking to a few people, we formed a mulling group and right away decided to just work within the network that, that we're already familiar with and then kind of branch out from there and change. So that's the initiating group. Um, one of our, that's the first meeting we had. And we, we also did try to do our own sort of meta mapping just within our own group figured out what organizations we might reach out to that we already knew can change. So the first one we partnered with, and we you'll you'll hear my my term partnered with because anything we did was always with partners because we had zero money and uh, the partnerships were, were fairly logical. This is the only food co-op in the state of Nevada. Okay, so we're we're working with a very different population than the population in Washington and Oregon. Uh, several of the members of our initiating group had also been on the food co-op board, so we had a good relationship there. The Food Farm Fest, uh, the idea was to sort of just get Transition Reno out in the community so that they knew we kind of existed and uh, we could start dialogue with them and change. So we had local farmers, it was in the fall, and uh, they sold their fall harvest and some uh, fall planting. You can see our little transition Reno uh, demonstration area and the permaculture were kind of one and the same. We also changed, had a uh, demonstration on making your own solar oven inexpensively so that people could come away with a little bit of knowledge and they didn't have to feel like they, you know, had to invest a lot of money in it. Okay, change. Uh, sold t-shirts, organic, locally printed, <laughs> got resilient, so. <laughs> I keep going. Uh, after that, we reached out to uh, a faith organization that was already doing the 350.org Climate Action Day. We worked with them, the Unitarians. They uh, they gave us a, a good platform because we had uh, one of the things we did in our enthusiasm was sort of just like, oh, we gotta do we gotta do an event. So after that, it's like, oops. 350 is coming. We didn't plan for that. We have to find somebody else that might be doing it. So I would advise people if, if you're doing an event now, I mean this is a year later, it might be good to have a year-long schedule to think about how do I want to pace these events? How do we want to pace them so you don't burn out one event after another? Uh, we are all 
newbies at this. So we're learning on a steep learning curve. Anyway, keep going. Uh, this was, again, uh, the 350 Reno. I think we were one of very few people, uh, groups in Nevada that did a 350 climate change, but it's okay. We're, you know, we're out there trying to do our thing. <laughs> and made connections with a lot of people from the faith community that, that was with the Unitarian Church. So we go, you know, having not exactly learned our lesson about pacing ourselves, we went right into a film series. We made, uh, <laughs> so I might be sort of learned by not what we did, <laughs> but from what we did. Uh, we partnered with the local community college who, uh, like this community college, was very, very giving of their facilities and their time. The, um, the gentleman who we partnered with, Manny Bacara, he is their techno dude for the whole community college, so he made a website for us. Besides the website we'd already started for Transition Reno, where people could go to Involve to Evolve. We, uh, of course, put on a bunch of films. The idea was maybe we should get a conversation going. Uh, we also wanted to reach out to the community college students because we felt like the thing about Reno, and I, I'll be very interested to find out from other people, when you're in kind of a city and it's like a 30,000 people, there's so much going on that we are just one tiny little blip in the whole chaos of what you could do. So it's not like we're the only show in town. So we felt like we had to do a lot of events to try to even just scratch the surface of letting people know that transition existed in Reno. Uh, after each of these films, we also had, um, we accidentally, we wanted to have a panel of discussion afterwards. So we invited local experts and local interested people that had experience in the areas of garbage and waste management, kilowatt hours. Uh, we partnered with the uh, Mountain Talk Coal Removal People, uh, Future Food Local Farmers we partnered with, and a Local Food Network and the Food Co-op, who killed the electric car. There's an electric car club, very active electric car club in Reno. We partnered with them, and they brought their electric cars to that one. Escape from Suburbia was about planners, and we had some really great uh, local uh, planners, green planners, that came in and talked to that. But for the next seven generations, there are several tribes in the area, the Washoe and the, the other uh, Paiute tribes. Some of those people, that was an interesting connection, but some of those people came and worked with us uh, to talk about the heart and soul piece of the next center seven generations, our community and another one, and then we did the transition. And what was great is, in connecting with those panelists, we connected with a whole new range of organizations and groups, and that, that was really helpful because I think in one of our uh, questions about preparing for the panel was, how do you build social capital? And uh, again, we're all new at this and we didn't realize, but that's really a good way to build some social capital with the people in the Okay. Uh, here's some examples of, of where we were having panelists after each film and the discussion and we tried very hard to get everybody who came to turn to their neighbor or to somebody they didn't know before the film, connect with them, then after the film do it again. We, we really rely heavily on the information we get from Transition US and everywhere we can in terms of techniques for helping to build some community connection. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the, oh, that's an electric motorcycle, all electric, and there's, you know, Nevada has a lot of solar, so it's, it, it's a, you know, no-brainer there. And the students, there's an example of having, uh, there was one uh, professor at the community college who uh, committed to bringing her student class for every film. So that was exciting to get student input and questions. Go ahead. Uh, that's this banner here. Uh, oh, and I can... Uh, it up later, but Art Town is an event that, that's been going on in Reno for about 14 or 15 years. So that's an established event. They have established PR, and people know this is happening. And one of our uh, members decided, he's a real visual guy, even though he's not an artist, and he goes, we need to have a way that people can start to visualize this. So he put out a call to artists. Go ahead. And uh, th this is some of the um, information he put out to get artists to come and uh, we invited them to 
consider uh, a future you know, energy or transition. We also par partnered with the Electric Car Club, which is their logo down there. They help with the money, which was nice because we didn't have any. We, we put out donation jars, but you know, you get what you get. <laughs> um, on the right-hand side, that's the little um, handbill or flyer we had. Um, he invited this one woman who, who would come with us to a place in Reno and you know, it doesn't look like that now, but people would describe to her, well, we'd really like to see it like this, and wouldn't it be great if it was that? And she took yeah, she visual really notes, and she came up with these drawings mm -hmm. of how yeah. to visualize, and these are real places in Reno, so people could recognize that, oh, there's possibilities here. Thank you, Brian. Um, we had artists respond in many ways. <laughs> and as our as Ken, who's one of our group members, he, he realized you can't tell artists what to draw. <laughs> and um, over here, this gentleman, James, he did a tornado destroying downtown Reno. <laughs> and we're like, now how is that positive? <laughs> and he's like, well this is a tornado of energy. And tornadoes create energy, which it, which they do. And so we learned and he is a uh, hooked into the native population. So it, this picture of the native people uh, praying, and I appreciate what the gentleman said this morning about prayer, about that spiritual peace uh, that we need to connect with a larger whole. So that that's his, I'm not trying to explain it for you, however you want to see it, but that's how he told us that there would be this. Uh, after he did this painting, uh, he went back, uh, it just happens that he did this other painting. <laughs> We've never done a self-portrait. And that is his heart, of course, maybe you can't see it, but that's a crown of thorns. And he really got the heart and soul piece. And he's not in a group, he's just like, boy, to make change, you need to connect with your heart. And so this was some of it, I uh, can change. Um, after that, we took a break, <laughs> and that was in July. And we are heading up to our mission, and in fact, ours will be at 10-10-10. Um, so, you know, in a few weeks, we're like, going there. And we thought, okay, how do we really get buy-in from the other organizations in the area? So we invited the uh, 10 really active local organizations and some of their people to a giant local food party that we prepared all the food for in um, my friend Yana's backyard, and Yana will be presenting the next thing. Uh, and to tell them about transition face-to-face -face and get their buy-in and say, well, would you like to be part of this? Would you like to help us? And they go, definitely. So we're getting a lot of, of help from, from this idea. And plus, one of our organization members said, you know, when you feed people, it changes the way they feel about <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I Okay, so this is us. They recognize me and we're giving little talks to everybody and they're like, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. I'll be able to report back how that worked. And uh, even our youngest members will be involved. Uh, this woman in particular writes the green. She's a green editor for our local uh, uh, weekly news journal. And uh, she's uh, really hooked in and helped us a lot. Not She can't help us exactly, but she can certainly get the word out about our events. Okay. And that's the first banner that we did where we were trying to visualize, this is the Reno skyline, and uh, these, these buildings actually exist there, and they pretty much look more like the left side with all the smog, etc. <laughs> but we wanted to get some visual transition into wind and solar, and we now actually have, uh, there are actually wind generators on the city hall, not, not due to us, but because of the synergy that's going on, and there's other groups, so that's, that's it. Back in um, two years ago, Portland held the uh, World Car Free Cities Conference. The first time it was held in North America, it was the <coughs> international one. We had a uh, car free day uh, just uh, two days before that, so I made a film. This film was made in two days. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, 11 minutes long, but I'm going to show you the first seven minutes of it. Uh, what is, this is, is a uh, citywide, large uh, block set of block parties, actually. There's, uh, and, and it was first started in this one Funky Street, um, which is here, and I'll, you'll, you'll see it. It basically it's, just, it's, it's a large block party, seven or eight blocks, 
basically open the street up and people will come, essentially. And uh, what I did was I filmed uh, how that car that single block party was morphed into now seven or, well, actually, many, many, about 30 smaller ones, but uh, seven major, six or seven major ones across the city, and we do it just once a year. But uh, I'll just let the film explain it, and, and the main effort to create the film was to look at how you organize a party for 125,000 people with no money. <laughs> this is how we do it. All right, uh, let's go. the training in Portland and we've become um, an official transition initiative in Seattle. Um, I think actually the film really captured a lot of what I might have to offer in terms of the event that we did. Um, we put our first large community event on this past August, August 21st, and we called it Planet Home. And the idea around our event was um, uh, organizing the the space around rooms of the house and what you could do in each each of the different rooms in order to save energy, save resources, um, become more resilient, um, and it, it worked out really well actually it's, it, because because of the rooms of the house really became like the pods that Randy was talking about. Um, it helped us sort of organize, give different people different jobs to do. So if you're in charge of the kitchen, you might take care of. Um, getting the cheese making demonstration or um, you know question and, question and answers around sustainable kitchens I think we had canning demonstrations and that kind of thing um, in the garden that's really a, was a really popular place uh, permaculture um, goat keeping in the city you know sheet mulching and composting and all those kinds of things we had a wonderful garage um, area of our space that was we had a, a guy who happens to be my husband um, teaching people how to sharpen tools and we had an electric bike demonstration so and then we had a speaker stage with all kinds of different topics the thing that I think really worked for the event was that it wasn't a commercial event we really didn't want to have the kind of event where people are walking around to tables and gathering brochures we really wanted to have opportunities for people in our neighborhood and in a city neighborhood, um, you really need this. You need ways for people to connect with each other. And that's really, and because of the way we organize the space around the house, it kind of gathered people into, into spaces rather than just along roads, which is how our cities are organized now already. Um, you know, we put straw bales around for people to sit on. We had round tables with chairs. Um, we had so many different things going on and so many ways for people to really connect. We had solar oven, someone came doing solar ovens, and, we, and then we also had children's activities. Um, we had a recycled art project and a community art project where people made hearts with a message towards Mother Earth, um, which was a great way for people who don't want to talk to really come and be visual and, and join in a, around a table doing colors and crayons and making art was really a popular place, which was a surprise to me. So, um, yeah, I think um, overall it was a really successful event. It was totally chaotic in the planning, totally chaotic. And I was very involved in that, and I, and I tend to be a chaotic person, which is why I don't have any uh, audio visual. <laughs> um, and, and I was, and there were several of us losing sleep the night before. How is this ever going to work? How is this going to work? It's not going to work. And even the day of the, the morning of, it's, it, it's total chaos. And then it was just such an amazing thing to see it all just sort of, it felt like the chaos just all settled and this event happened and it was just beautiful. So I, it, I really learned a lot myself 
just about let, letting the chaos be and, and really sort of celebrating that. And I think in this movement, we really need that to allow it to be what it is and then to keep going and yes. not just give up. So um, that's what I'll that's what I have to say. Whippy Island is, is a rural farming community, and so much of what we do really centers around food. And uh, we have monthly potlucks, and those have been going on, I think, since the beginning. I've only been involved for about six months, so I'm still kind of learning all the history. But generally, the potlucks obviously are about food we eat, we all bring food, and they're thematic, and there's always you know, either a presentation or um, some kind of hands-on exercise. So we try to make it very experiential, but also educational. And um, uh, just keep kind of going. Um, and since one of the things we talked about addressing here was money, I thought I would start with a big fundraiser we held last July. And we had this Energy Independence Day party. And what we did was we partnered with Tilt, which has a really nice campus on the island. We have a little the office where we don't really have a space to do things. And generally, our potlucks are inside. Though we thought it would be really nice to be outside since it was July and in theory it wasn't going to rain. And it actually turned out to be a beautiful hot day and keep going. And um, we had entertainment and we had an auction and a raffle and we actually had a $5,000 grant from APOC fund and 2500 of that was matching and so we raised almost exactly 2500 of this fundraiser so what was the organization? that our match. What's the organization? That we got the money from APOC? which is a sort of a self-selecting uh, ending fund. So yeah, it spent its money and went away. Right. Yeah. But we, we got a couple grants now, which was great. Um, and so this month, we'll keep going. This month, we've been focusing on eating local. And actually, I can push the button, so I'll be really okay. smart. Just if you click there, you can say anywhere. Right and left. Right and left. Right. Yeah. OK. So this has been our Eat Local Month, and it started with our September potluck. And everybody brought local dishes. And what we did at the potluck was we went around and we put up large pieces of paper. And then people went around and filled in what they knew about how to get local food, how to, how to get local resources. And so it was divided up into categories. Um, we have raffles every month. And so this one, the raffle, was some local food that was being raffled off. And generally, it tends to be that anyways. People tend to bring things from their garden and to, to really like to share things from their garden, even when it's not garden season. So people went around and they, on um, pieces of paper, divided by category. So it was like that one, I can't read what it says, but grains it was and grains and beans, there was produce, there was beverages. And people just went around and you know put what they knew about what was available locally. And the parameters were 100 miles, because at the moment doing a 10 mile dive, but the rest of us aren't trying to be quite that good. Um, <laughs> And so then once everybody broke down what they knew, then we reconvened and we talked about you know, what we had learned, what we knew, and what we could add to it, what the gaps were. And so that's really what we're doing now is we're creating a document that goes through and says this is all the local resources we know about, these are the gaps we know about, and then we'll take that back, back out to the community. And eventually, hopefully, what we'll generate is a really good would be resource directory for resilient entities on the island. So we're starting with really the food piece of it right now. And um, we also have a film series, twice a month film series, that we try and tie in with whatever the theme is that month. And so August and September, we've been showing films about local eating. Um, and actually, because we have, that's our Facebook page, because you know, like everybody else, we have very low budget. We've been, we download some films, which of course sometimes affects quality, but we have a little, we ask for donations, then we have a little jar, and then our jar fills up, then we can go out and go out and film, or you know, pay screening fees for the films occasionally. But we're actually doing a um, big event on the 28th of this month where we're partnering with, with Tilth again. We're holding it at the Senior Center, so we're partnering with them. They've donated the facilities. Um, they're, we're showing the film Good Food, which was made by local Whidbey Island filmmakers. And they'll be there. They waived all the fees. They'll be there to talk about, you know, lead the discussion. And then we have local chefs and local farmers donating all the food to a local winery. So like we all said, food and drink and music and yeah. entertainment. People get on board. So there's been a lot of buzz about it. Hopefully we'll get a lot of people that are not really seen as a fundraiser. 
you know, we're sharing the, the whatever we take in with all the entities that we're partnering with. But we see it as a really great way to partner to really generate more, more excitement, more energy, more outreach, and hopefully it'll just keep building from there. So I think that's it for our panel. I think we're way out of time. So uh, thanks. And I don't know if we have a minute or two for Q and A for anybody, or do you want us just out here? I think people will be starting to come in. So do you want us out here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>